Welcome to the Catbird Quilts. I'm Kathy Martin, and in today's video, I want to talk about how to work with thin fabric. And I have a lot to say about it. So first, let's talk about the difference between thin fabric and threadbare fabric and flimsy fabric, and they're not the same. So if you've ever worked with Liberty Lawn fabric or other thin quilting cottons, you know, just because it's thin does not mean it's not sturdy. But there are fabrics that are thin because they've been worn and worn and worn and washed and worn again, and they can get threadbare. Um, and that is a different thing. And then there are fabrics that are not especially thin, like you wouldn't call it thin, uh, but it's flimsy. So I want to show you a couple of those, and then we're going to get busy talking about how to make it work for you. We're going to have a wadded up scenario <laughs> on my table while I go over this. So these first ones, these are shirts. Obviously, this is a shirt that has not been broken down yet. This is a whole other can of worms. And then this is a um, shirt as well. But let's talk about these first ones. And this you may recognize if you've been with me for a while and watch the first quilt uh, series. I used this as my light medium blue in my gingham quilt. So these are all thin by nature. The actual shirt fabric itself is very thin. And you can see, you probably see, like if I held it up, no, not quite sheer, maybe. I'm making a face. Can you see it? <laughs> you can see my hand through this one. This is that um, very light blue. And a lot of times you'll find shirts like this in your thrift store, or if you're a memory quilt maker, someone will give you a shirt that was the departed person and they're, they're thin on purpose. It's like a summer shirt. In this case, linen, you can see my hand through that. Um, and of course the lighter the shirt and light by color, not light by weight, um, the more sheer it will be. And the more, this one, very obvious, you can see my hand through that. So it's very, very light, very, very light in color and lightweight thin. This shirt I bought with the intention of maybe using it on the navy quilty stars blocks that I'm kind of working on. And it is so thin that it is almost sheer. You can really see through it, I bet. And so these shirts are not, these are not situations where they've been worn down and are thin. They're just thin. The fabric itself is thin. By contrast, this is a, this was a sheet that I got from the thrift store and it has been worn and, or not worn, but worn <laughs> from people sleeping on it. And it's probably been washed 1 million times. And you can see it's also very thin. But if you look right here, hopefully we can get a detail of that. When I was taking it apart, just even putting the seam reaper through it, it just tore just like that. In actually several places, there's a there's a hole there. There's a very big hole there. And you can tell by feel and also by how easy that Seam Reaper went through it and cut it, that it has been worn down so much that it's thin because it's been used. It's not thin because it's thin by nature, although sheets typically are kind of thin. So that I would call more like a threadbare situation. I did use this <laughs> on a quilt backing and we made it work, but it, it was really very thin. And then if you have never heard the term threadbare, here is a perfect example. So this is a chambray shirt, uh, actually of a friend who gave it to me and where he either tucked it in or sat 
on it. Um, you can see like this is the definition of threadbare. It has gotten pulled and you can even see there's a color difference between where it was worn and not worn. So this would be something that you would probably not want to quilt. Definitely not this section. <laughs> I think that's obvious. That's a difference between, so this and this are in the same family versus this, which is made to be thin. And so when I'm talking about thin fabrics, I'm talking about this, not this. <laughs> and so you wanna try to avoid so the how to work with this is don't, <laughs> don't, just avoid it. So I'll probably use that chambray shirt and just cut off the part that's threadbare. As for this fabric, it could be used, but I might have to do something with it. And that brings me to our topic of what do you do to get your thin fabrics where you can work with them in a quilt? And this is where I have so much to say. So I'm gonna use these shirts that are in front of me to talk about what you can do to compensate for having thin fabric. And this one that I said is a whole other ball of wax, uh, part of the deal with this one, and I'll just go on and say this in advance, this is a very thin fabric and it's also cotton poly. So it has kind of a double challenge with it. And then this uh, plaid flannel right here, this is what I mean by not thin, but flimsy. So it's, it's, not, it's not very thin um, and it's definitely not sheer at all, but it's flimsy from the standpoint of it's got a lot of stretch in piecing kind of acts like it's thin. So what I'm gonna do for these purposes, the purposes of this video, is we're gonna treat flimsy and thin as if they're the same. So this is, again, this is not a thin, most, most flannel is not thin, but it generally is, it's not structurally very sturdy. It's, it's very flimsy, it has a lot of give. And that's kind of the way thin shirts work as well, both in piecing and in pressing and in the actual quilting. So we're gonna start by talking about using thin shirts in piecing. So when you have thin shirts and you're gonna be doing piecing, there comes a time that you have to consider whether you need to stabilize your fabric in some way and you have to consider your pattern and your pieces in doing so. So the first thing you wanna decide is if you're gonna be doing a lot of flip and trim or half square triangles or flying geese, or if you're gonna be using your fabric on the bias, meaning cutting across the grain, diagonally across the grain. If your shirts are thin, then they are gonna probably have a lot of stretch and or a lot of give. And sometimes, and in the case of the cotton poly, they'll slide underneath your sewing machine. The first stabilizing solution I want to offer you is starching. I'm a big fan of using starch because it is cheap and easy you can make your own. I do make my own. And in fact, I have a video on that if you want to look it up. And you can go heavy or light with your starching. So depending on how thin your fabric is, you can decide for yourself just how much starch you want to use to give it that stability. In this case, I have a, these few um, shirts here. This one has a little bit of starch and you can see it's still very... Um, I don't know that I want to say it's soft, but it definitely has movement in it. This shirt that I used in that quilt has no starch and it's very, very soft. There's no, there's no stability here at all. And then the one next to it, which is this white linen, I heavily starched it and you can kind of see, do you see it? It's, it almost feels like paper. Um, and I've called that cardboardy in the past. It's very stiff. And then same for this tan fabric. I have starched it enough that it has some stiffness to it. 
the pros of using starch are it washes out, so it stiffens it while you're working with it, but then once your quilt is made and bound and washed, the starch washes out, and so the softness is retained, and that kind of silky, smooth, really, it's not just soft, but it's also really pliable, you get that back in the end quilt. So it's very soft and comforting um, in the end. The other couple of pros about using starch, and I referenced it already, is you can decide how much stiffness you want and choose accordingly. So you can put a lot of starch in it and make it really stiff, or you can do just enough so that it's, you can handle it well. Another pro of using starch is it makes your cutting and your piecing more accurate. It stabilizes that fabric. It kind of glues those threads together. And if you do it in advance and let it dry in, then when you go to cut your pieces, your pieces will be very accurate or it helps with the accuracy. It also can give it a little bit of substance so that if you're using a thin fabric alongside perhaps a thicker fabric in your quilt, it'll give it a little bit of thickness. And, which we'll get to this when we talk about pressing, um, it'll help hold that crease when you're doing pressing. The cons to using starch, especially if you use a heavy application, it's very stiff and very rough. So this linen feels like an emery board right now. And that makes it not as an enjoyable experience when you're sewing and handling the fabric. Most of us like that soft feel, that tactile experience while we're quilting. It's much stiffer, much more papery and rough, um, which of course is temporary, but while you're quilting, it, it feels kind of rough. Um, another con to using starch is if you're not careful when you're starching, you can starch your fabric off grain or out of out of true. So if you, and I noticed this when I was, I've used this chartreuse green linen in a project already. So I spray down the, the surface of the linen and kind of spread it out like this. If you're not careful and you do one of these guys and it distorts the fabric, it will glue it in, in a warped or distorted fashion. And then when you wash it and the starch is gone, the fabric is going to want to go back to on grain. And so in your end quilt, it can distort your piecing. So your, your squares may have been perfectly square when you sewed them in, but if your fabric is not on grain and is glued down, not on grain, then when you wash it and dry it, it will go back to trying to be on grain and it might distort your piecing. Now, so much so that it's problematic, that's for you to decide, but that is a possibility. I have had that happen, particularly with linen. Um, so that's a con. There aren't a lot of cons, honestly, to using starch. And that's mostly because it's temporary and washes out. That's really it. It's coarse. It feels rough. And if you kind of get it worked the wrong way, then your piecing and your end result can get a little mixed up. The second option for stabilizing your fabric is using interfacing. I get this question a lot. Do you use interfacing with your piecing, especially with thin fabric? And I'll be honest with you, I'm a little biased against interfacing. I, I really don't like using it, but it is an option. So let me get, get that out and show you. So I have a few interfacing options in front of me. This one I've had so long, the package <laughs> has faded. This one is lightweight. What you can get that will work is a fusible 
interfacing. And if it's very thin and you're working with shirts, I would suggest you use a feather weight or the lightest weight available. I must have used mine up. I didn't actually have that as an example. These are all Pelin um, interfacing. One of these is midweight. This one says for light to medium weight fabrics. And actually, if you read the subtitle. It says perfect interfacing for any blouse and dress weight fabric. So these are, I mean, it's not a blouse, it's a shirt, but this is the sort of thing that you would get. If you're not familiar with interfacing, what it is, is synthetic fibers that have been woven together with like an adhesive. And when you iron it onto your fabric, it meshes with your fabric and stabilizes it. And that can be really, really beneficial if you have an especially thin fabric that you're using. And in the case of memory quilt makers, sometimes it's necessary. Um, if you're not going to the thrift store and buying shirts to use as fabric, if you're given shirts or given fabrics to use in a quilt and they're very, very thin, interfacing can, can be a real friend. The pros of using interfacing is it's permanent. And so you iron that down, you can iron it to an entire piece of shirt uh, and it adds significant thickness. Even the featherweight interfacing is going to add a lot of thickness to a otherwise very thin shirt, especially those ones that are very sheer. And you can press it in and now you're good to go, which is great. And no matter whether you wash it, dry it, it is going to retain the shape that you cut that fabric into. So that is a pro. It stabilizes and adds thickness to your fabric. And no matter what you do with it, once it's cut, it's going to keep that shape. And it's a little easier to cut, truthfully, when there's a little bit of thickness. Sometimes if a shirt is very, very thin, even with starch, it, it feels like it wants to slide underneath that rotary cutter. So having that extra thickness allows you to get accurate cuts. And then that makes it a little easier when you're sewing your pieces. It also especially if you're using much thicker fabrics together with your thin fabrics, it kind of helps match that thickness to thickness. So you don't have a seam where you have a thicker shirt coming into a thin shirt. It kind of matches that up. So that's a pro. Another pro for using interfacing is it stays soft. You can feel the adhesive, um, the, you know, the thermal layer that helps it that the heat activates and bonds it to the fabric, it's become soft on both sides. So the texture of your fabric going in is soft to the touch and the interfacing will be generally soft to the touch. So as you're handling your fabrics while you're sewing and cutting and ultimately pressing and quilting, it will feel soft like fabric. It doesn't get that hard, rough kind of cardboard paper feel it's it feels like fabric so if that's a something that you're looking for and you really don't like using a very stiff um, fabric that will help and so that's also a pro and if you're making a quilt for the sake of warmth so you're trying to make a you know cozy especially like flannel quilt the interfacing is going to add a sense of warmth and thickness uh, because you can imagine a, a cotton fabric that's very thin like this, it breathes and so it's not as warm. So if I were to put a layer of interfacing on this, it's going to hold heat, the heat of the person underneath the quilt a little bit better. That's also a con. So I have made quilts for a couple of ladies my age and maybe you guys can relate and by guys I mean ladies in my group men you may or may not relate to this unless you're like some family members that I have that hold heat I like for my bedding and blankets and quilts to breathe 
because I get hot in the night and I don't want to be under something that's holding the heat. I want it to actually release the heat. So depending on your application, if you want, if you're using cotton batting and cotton quilt top and cotton backing, it's going to be warm, but it's going to breathe well. If you put a lot of interfacing or if you're using pieces that have interfacing, those areas are not going to breathe as well just by nature. They have their synthetic fibers, there's glue there. Um, so you just go into that knowing that. So to me, that's a con. It could also be a pro. Another con is that it does, once you have interfacing on your shirt fabric, it does not press well. So it doesn't hold a crease because it has change the thickness of your fabric and it is synthetic. So very much like those cotton poly shirts, a lot of times it doesn't want to fold back on itself and hold that press. So in a seam allowance, if you're needing to press back toward the shirt that has the interfacing, it's going to resist that press. Um, and sometimes you end up using starch and interfacing because you need the starch to hold the shirt into how you're pressing it. So to me, that's a con. Also, end your end quilt top and then quilt, even though the softness is retained, it will be stiffer, which of course is the point of interfacing, is to make it stiffer so you can piece it, but it retains that stiffness. And it's only after multiple washing and drying that it will start to kind of soften and loosen um, and have that really bendable softy. So it's soft to the touch, but it's it's stiffer in your end. I wish I had a touch button so that I could just let you reach through and feel it. It's just firmer. It's just stiffer. And so your end quilt top and then your end quilt will be a little stiffer across the surface of it. Whereas in comparison to the starch, starch washes out and it's just that very, very soft and bendable and moldable. Um, and so that to me is also a con. Now, if you're going for a quilt that you want for a wall hanging or if you are not expecting it to be washed significantly and you want it to have that not as crinkly look, then that's going to be a pro for you because it's going to hold that shape and it's not going to crinkle up like a quilting cotton or a shirt that's been starched. And then the last con that I have identified with interfacing is actually the same con as the starch. If you press, so let's, let's take my blue fabric and I, let's say I have this big piece and I press interfacing into this. If I get this off when off grain, when I press the interfacing to it, it is going to be off grain and so warped possibly or distorted. Sorry, can't, can't, can't do it. <laughs> it's going to be distorted and then it's going to be permanently distort it because it does fuse, that interfacing fuses to the fabric itself. So not as important in a solid fabric, but if you have a fabric that's plaid or stripes, and as you, you can see, even as I'm, I'm doing this with my hands, it's pulling those, there's a stripe there. It's pulling it kind of into a curve that would be set into the fabric before you even begin piecing. So in your end quilt, if you have plaids or stripes or some other pattern that you can see if it's kind of warped or off true, that is the way it will be. Um, and I don't, I haven't used a lot of interfacing with my quilts. I have done that with some garment sewing and I will tell you it's, I mean, it it's warped there and it will always be warped there. So that's something to consider. I did want to move on and talk about when you're doing your pressing with thin fabrics, because that's a whole other thing. So let's do that now before I move on. I remembered something. 
This cotton poly shirt that I referenced that is very, very thin, as a reminder, whether you use starch or interfacing, you're going to want to use a lot of pins in your piecing. So before we move, to, move on to pressing, while we're still talking about piecing, um, but especially if you only use starch, just the nature of poly, it slides underneath the sewing needle. So you definitely want to pin more than you would with just a standard linen, cotton, or flannel, uh, because it really will just like slide under the needle. So didn't, didn't want to miss that. So now on to pressing. So let's talk about the difference in pressing with fabric that's been starched and pressing with fabrics that have been interfaced. The great thing about starch, I'm biased. It's I, I'm presenting this like I'm, I, let me just put up front, I'm biased. I love starch. Starching will help your pressing. So when you've done your pieces together and you're pressing your seams either open or to one side, if your fabric has been starched, the heat activates the starch and then it forms that crease or wrinkle if you iron, <laughs> if you iron it wrong, but it'll hold that seam. It'll hold that crease. Uh, I did reference this. I kind of alluded to it. If your piece has interfacing in it, even if it's a featherweight, it's not going to want to bend back on itself. So you have to go into that knowing it's it's challenging to press piecing that has been interfaced. And you may find yourself needing to starch your seams from the top so that it will do a better job of holding that. Or if you do starch the underside where the interfacing is, what you're really doing is starching the side that does not have the interfacing. So just know if you do your pressing and you have pieces that have been interfaced, it is it, it doesn't hold a crease in my experience. Now, I'm sure there are some out there that are better than others, but in my experience, pressing piecing that has been interfaced is not as easy and does not hold a crease as well. Also, when you're pressing thin fabrics, you are going to want to be very careful to press straight down. Uh, I've noticed a lot. I've watched a lot of videos too, quilting videos too. You guys, I watch quilting videos just like you do. And a lot of people will take their pieces and they'll fold it back and then use the iron itself to kind of coax that seam back. So here is a piece that I have seamed uh, together. These are not thin and we're gonna, we're gonna role play and pretend. What I would typically do, fold this back, finger press, oh my, the threads. And then I would take my iron and press down on it to get that seam. I have seen, do you like that? This is my iron. Um, <laughs> I was looking to see if there was something that was a little closer. I'm sure there probably is, but I haven't found it. So in a thin fabric combination, you would definitely want to get a very firm finger press. For people that do the iron, they like hold it like this and then use the iron to push it. What will happen is that thin fabric gets distorted with the heat of the iron and the, the pressure going across. So I will show you just even with the pressure of my hand. So let's say I'm ironing this way and it's folded back and I use the iron to push that. Do you see how that just, I mean, it just distorts that fabric. So if you have, and I referenced this in the beginning, if you have half square triangles, flip and trim, like in a snowball scenario or flying geese, and you're using really thin fabrics, when you use your iron, you want to press directly straight down, especially with the flip and trim, because you can completely distort your piecing. So if you're if you're going for a piece that's been fold back, folded back like this, now you press that straight down and you don't have a nice square anymore. You have a something else. <laughs> and I know this because I have done it. And the Magnolia quilt that I'm working on, I used this very fabric and I did not starch it very heavily. And when I went to do those snowball corners and the flip and trim and 
I, I work against it all the time. I put my iron down and went like this. And then I had a rhombus instead of a square. And so then when I go to piece that to the next piece beside it, my seams are not straight. And then it's like, which one do you trust? <laughs> do you trust the, if this is not square, so I can't, so now I've got extra hanging off. It's just a mess. You just don't want to do that. So I would suggest that when you go into your pressing, you want to open your seams out, use your fingers to press your seam allowance down, try to hold it and then press your iron directly straight down on it instead of using the iron to push that seam. So just life experience at work here. <laughs> trust me, trust me on this. So that's something to consider um, with your pressing and very thin fabrics. So it will behoove you if you have used starch to use it heavy because it helps with your finger pressing and then with the ironing. In my quilt story of the checkerboard quilt, which I made for my friend Tiffany, I talked at length about how I had a section of piecing, I pieced the back, and there was a whole section of fabrics that I had stitched together and they were kind of big pieces. It was like eight by eight, I think. And so it was these plaids stitched to each other and I made the top, made the back, made the whole quilt sandwich, started quilting, running that thing through the machine just like a boss, and then flipped the quilt over and realized that the whole entire middle piece section was like this. <laughs> it was like, oh, <laughs> so totally crooked. And in the story, I explained how I actually picked out all the quilting took the whole thing apart, put interfacing in that section, remade the quilt sandwich, and then finally quilted it in the end. So quilting, apart from piecing and pressing, is affected, or thin fabrics are affected by quilting. So if you have done a lot of piecing and you have a lot of thin fabrics, and especially if you have that on the back of your quilt, um, and your quilt sandwich, you're going to want to think through that before you start your actual quilting. So in that case, I wish I had known I had, I had thin fabrics on either side of the piecing and I had thin fabrics in my piecing. So even if you've starched your fabrics and you've gotten your piecing nice and square, if you're working with thin fabrics on the back of your quilt, it might be something to consider to put a layer of interfacing, iron a layer of interfacing down on your piecing before you make your quilt sandwich. So if you've done some interesting piecing on the back or on the front, and you have a sense that if you're going to do a long line of straight, straight line quilting, that's what I did. I did like a hashtag cross hatch pattern. So if you have a big quilt and you're doing a lot of straight line quilting, you want to think about how that quilting is going to go against the piecing that you have. So even if you haven't put interfacing in your piecing, you may want to consider putting interfacing across a section of your quilt top or quilt back. So in the case of the checkerboard quilt, I actually took a long piece of interfacing and just ironed down that interfacing to that whole middle section to keep it stable and stiff. And because it was on the back in that case, I wasn't too terribly concerned about it being stiff. Um, it, and I felt like it was needed. So you may, in evaluating your choices, you may be like, well, I don't really want it to be stiff, but I, I need the structural stability of the interfacing. So definitely consider before you start your, your quilt sandwich and before you start quilting, think through, is this thin fabric going to warp or distort or pull as you're doing your quilting, especially if you're quilting at home, um, like I do occasionally, I've gotten kind of out of it <laughs> because long arm people are amazing. But if you're quilting on your home machine, that's going to need to be in your decision-making. 
Also, if you have not done any interfacing, and even if you have starched, um, if you have a very thin fabric, and people talk about this all the time, when you've got three layers of quilt sandwich, so backing, batting, or wadding, if you're not from here, and thin fabrics on the top are going through your machine, and the point of a walking foot is to try to get those three layers where they'll go through the machine. Here we go with the hungry, hungry hippos again at the same rate. But if you have a thin fabric on the top, really, or the bottom, it's going to pull at a different rate than your other fabrics. And I know this <laughs> because I have experienced it. And sometimes it will go through the machine faster and sometimes not fast enough. So what I experienced in using this blue fabric when I made that little gingham baby quilt is as I was, I wasn't pushing, you're not supposed to be pushing, but as I'm letting the fabric, the quilt sandwich go through the sewing machine, the top fabric, which was this very thin blue, would go in such a rate that it would fold back on itself and create puckers and where it overlaid the quilting from the other direction. And it also stretched the fabric just going through the walking foot. And so some of the pieces of that quilt that I made, um, and those were little five inch squares, it's not very straight and you can see where it kind of folded back on itself, uh, which I hate. I want it to be nice and pristine. It's something to consider. So you might consider starching your quilt top before you make your quilt sandwich so that when you do the quilting, also if your machine has the ability to change the pressure of your presser foot. So I have found that if I can take some of the pressure, like it's not pressing down quite as firm from my presser foot, then that top goes through at a little better rate. And so it doesn't have that, that extra pressure of the presser foot doesn't pinch it back and make it so on top of itself. So when you're doing your quilting, keep that in mind. And that's especially for straight line quilting, free motion quilting, you have, you know, you're going all different directions generally, so it doesn't do that as much, but it can pull that thin fabric. So just that's another consideration um, as you're working with these fabrics. And similarly, again, with the cotton poly, it wants to slide underneath that sewing needle and through the presser foot slightly differently. So don't be surprised if you have not put interfacing on it, that it it will do that and do some kind of funky things in the quilting process. So that would be one of those times that the benefit of having the interfacing is it makes it stiff enough where it doesn't, and it it's thicker, so it's not going to like pull and fold back on itself over those seams. So those are some thoughts about using thin fabrics in your quilting. Um, I hope it's been helpful for you. I don't want you to feel like you can't use any thin fabrics when you quilt because just like with cotton poly, sometimes that's what you have. And it just means you have to be thoughtful and sometimes compensate for it with starching, pinning, interfacing. When you find those thin fabrics, it's not really that they're necessarily not going to hold up. It's more that it just may require work on the back end. So what I find myself doing is unless I have a real need for a specific fabric that's thin, I do put that in the decision-making hopper and often will walk away from a thin shirt just because I know that I'm going to have to do a lot of compensation for it. So I hope that's been helpful for you considering thin fabrics and what you might do to make that work for you. I'm Kathy Martin. This is the Catbird Quilts. Thank you so much for watching. And that, what I'm saying is your red light is not on on that. Oh wait, yeah, it is. It was behind the cord. Okay.
Welcome to the Catbird Quilts. I'm Kathy Martin, and today I want to talk about <laughs> talk about. <laughs> and today I want to talk about. Do the whole thing. Okay. I had some weird buckle fry at the end, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I almost, <laughs> I almost, I almost want to do it again. Let me do it again, and if we end up with a better one, <clears throat> I still did it, but that's all right. I don't know what I got going on, but <laughs> I have a plug in that makes it work. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Sorry, I've got a huge itch right there. Okay. I've got this piece that's just driving me crazy.